My name is Kevin Avart. I'm a state representative representing Ward 1, Nashua, New Hampshire, Hillsborough 28. And uh, we'll just carry on the conversation. Sounds so, good. Um, you are kind enough to come. You're only the second state representative we've had, and we've now been to about 15 states. Interesting. Oh. We had one in Kentucky. The state of Kentucky agreed to let us film in their capital until we sent out a message to all the senators and representatives in Kentucky, and I'll be doggone if they didn't withdraw the invitation. But this one representative called and said he'd like to come out, and he sat down and told us what he thought and asked questions, and he's been a state rep for 20 years. All right. So how long have you been around? This is my freshman year. We're finishing out, and uh, we're actually campaigning for another term. Fantastic. So in November, will you... Is that when your election will be? Yes, yes. We're going to be primary because it seems like we've made some waves this year. So uh, the troops have come out against us, but uh, we're going to be fighting tooth and nail. We need to finish the work. And uh, what, what flavor of a political party are you? Well, I tend to be a conservative libertarian Republican, if I can coin such a phrase. Uh, well, you know, it's interesting. I was nominated for... Uh, U.S. House of Representatives by the Libertarians. Now, I, I didn't know what the Libertarians were exactly, but some of them are kind of kooky. They, they go crazy on the tax issue. They don't have the right, right to be taxed and all that. And that's, you know, it's a, a little bit out there. And so before I went to speak at their nominating thing, I read their platform, the national platform, and I took a red marker out to mark all the things I didn't agree with. And when I finished eight pages, I didn't mark anything. So I stood up in front of them and I said, I don't know if you guys know this, but a lot of folks think y'all are kind of crazy. <laughs> and they didn't laugh. Yeah. Uh, but they actually, the platform is, uh, is, is wonderful and it, it says all the right stuff. So. To, to nail it down, basically freedom, liberty, and uh, the Constitution. Uh, that pretty much sums up the, uh, the whole prospect of what a libertarian is. And as a conservative, uh, I, I, I believe that's what we used to sound, we used to be. And, uh, I think the, uh, the tendency that I'm hoping for is uh, bipartisanship in the House and of course that meaning between the conservatives and the libertarians because the Democrats seem to be putting up a stone wall when it comes to liberty issues on every front. Their God is the, is the state and it's, uh, as soon as you uh, start fighting against the state, they come out in, in droves and it, there's no love there. There's no love. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a conservative. If you don't want to answer any questions, don't. But when you came to uh, Concord on your first day on the job, did they call you together and say, your constituents don't matter anymore, you have, to re you have to just do what the party wants you to do, or anything like that? And if you don't want to comment, just say no comment. I don't recall anything like that. Actually, uh, a representative, J.R. Hole, pulled me aside and uh, let me know that uh, you know there's a group of us that are, are very very interested in in, in being heard. Uh, I think because of the 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 class, this particular class, we had uh, an interest of. You know what? I have to apologize. My phone is going off, it's so going uh, off. I will uh, shut that down. And apologize to the camera, but Let's go back a step. Yeah. Well, I. When we first were uh, elected and we were all brought together, we were taught of how things would work. And I think the biggest con thing that we were instructed on was to do your homework, do committee work. That's where the issues were, and that's where we were trying to we were lined up. But there was a spirit amongst this this class of freshmen that we will be heard. We're not going to just fall rank and do as we're told. This was the wrong class to do. These people have made a difference, and they're, 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 the majority of them are running back uh, for election. We believe in real healthy debate. Uh, and if you were to come to the House at any particular time, you would see two Republicans up debating the issues, and the Democrats watching us slug it out. Of course, they would be up there they're stonewalling and, and uh, uh, doing what they have to do to to break down anything that has to do with liberty, but uh, so uh, to answer your question, I guess in a nutshell, I don't believe that was that was the intent. It was more get your homework done. That's the key. 
uh, and do your committee work. There were times where we had to overturn some committee works. For instance, there, there was a, in the Johnson case and other cases uh, where these individuals were harmed by the courts. I can say that because I sit on the redress of grievance committee and I just came out of committee and we founded his case, David Johnson, petition number five. We voted uh, nine to, I believe it was nine to two, the two Democrats always being opposed to uh, the fact that there was uh, many instances of um, injustice, to, to say the least. And I'm, I'm looking for the phrase, but uh, due process, thank you very much. Uh, due process was, was interrupted. And we're finding in, 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 uh, in one committee where there seems to be the old guard, if you will, uh, uh, certain things would have affected the outcome in, in, say, the Johnson case, such as the sealed envelopes. In New Hampshire, right now, if a guardian at litem is appointed to your case and that guardian at litem doesn't like you, whatever they say, can have your child taken away from you. The evidence being hearsay, put in an envelope, given to the judge. The judge looks at it. Oh, uh, golf at 10. And, and I'm, I'm speaking tongue in cheek. I, that, we don't know what's in those sealed envelopes. Uh, but based upon the evidence that was brought before committee, uh, it would have to be extremely well documented, but it could be as little as a letter or blank. We don't know. But that sealed envelope holds that parent's fate in, in its hands. That sealed envelope says, you know what, Mr. Johnson, you can't see your child for three years based upon a guardian at litem's hearsay. We don't care about the evidence. We don't care about uh, the facts. What's in this envelope says you cannot see your child. And as a matter of fact, even though you were a, uh, a full-time parent, you had full custody, you had 60% custody, they break the, broke it down, now you have no custody, and you can't see what's in that document. It's happening over and over again. The Vandenberg case, a doctor, you know, based upon religious grounds, was founded Tuesday that his due processes and violations of the courts, judges, saying, I waive orders, not rules, but I waive orders and statutes and violating this person's liberty to be a parent. It's happening over and over again. We have the Haas's cases coming up. We have the, uh, the, the Youssef case coming up. Uh, the Dow case was just uh, founded that the, the guardian at litems are uh, uh, billing in advance. They're only allowed a thousand dollar cap. But in advance, but well, because they're lawyers, they know the judge. They may be somewhat related, either uh, through business practices. Somehow, there's an ancestral relationship between the guardian at litems and the judicial branch. I granted this is controversial. I don't care. Uh, and they're billing in advance, and then going back to the courts and saying, "Oh, by the way, we need an extension." You see, the statute says that there's only a thousand dollar cap per case. But you know what? You bill in advance, and we're going to go back and just we'll approve it. It's you know, it, it's a washing of hands. So we're seeing these in the New Hampshire family courts. We had the Frost case in New Hampshire, totally different and unrelated to the, the family courts, where uh, Mr. Frost uh, was making a business transaction, which happens thousands of times over over the, the course of of time through, through New Hampshire. It was a real estate transaction. The Attorney General went and uh, m basically misinterpreted the law, and that's exactly word for word what they said in our committee, uh, that, well, you know, sometimes we make a mistake. Their mistake could have put Mr. Frost in jail for five years with a, either $500 or an $800,000 fine. Don't quote me on it. <coughs> Excuse me. But we'll plea bargain with you for a year and five hundred thousand dollars. Mr. Frost said, "You know what? I'm innocent." 
It cost him $185,000 plus dollars to prove he was innocent. He, he appealed to the Supreme Court and he won. The Banking Commission, the Attorney General's office, didn't do things right. It's documented. It went before the committee. Evidence was shown. He was founded. Consequently, the Attorney General's office came out vehemently against the Redress of Grievance Committee here in New Hampshire. And it has to survive. This is the first time in 100 years that the Redress of Com Grievance Committee has been around. Part of Article 1, 31, I apologize, Article, Arti Article 31 of the, and 32 of the uh, New Hampshire Constitution allows the people to bring their petitions to the House to be heard, to make recommendations, and to be uh, uh, made whole, if you will. Speaker O'Brien, for the first time in history, brought this committee together. It's taken a long time. We're one of the last committees. We're still working on cases because of the complexities of them. People bring in their documentation and they say, hey, the state's been beating me up. I want to be heard. If I can make a little statement about CACR 26, it's very critical that on the ballot this year that the people vote yes. We fought tooth and nail. It started out as a repeal of an amendment which happened in 1978. 1978, there was a constitutional convention of some sort where this amendment got on the ballot, which said that the Supreme Court justice shall have rulemaking authority. But what wasn't on, and it was on the ballot, but what wasn't on the ballot? That such rules, uh, administrative rules, that the Supreme Court justice shall have, shall make, shall have the effect of law. So since 1978, the Supreme Court justices have been making rules that have the effect of law. That last line was not on the ballot. We proved it in committee. The uh, Secretary of State can show you that that last phrase, so when people were voting for that uh, constitutional amendment, they didn't realize that judges were going to make rules that will become law. And it's pervasive throughout all our, our, uh, our state. If the Department of Education makes a rule, guess what? It becomes law. What if the, the uh, uh, um, Fish and Game makes a rule? It becomes law. I was, fortunately, we, we broke one of those. We, we, we turned one of those rules into a, uh, a law which reversed its uh, effect. Um, silly case, but it had to do with the, uh, the Quaker birds. Uh, Representative Janine Nodder and I fought that rule and we changed the rule to allow Quaker birds into the New Hampshire. It, it sounds silly, but it, it, it's just pervasive in our government that rules have the effect of law and you can find people and pu punish them if they break these rules. So CACR 26, back on topic, is now on the ballot. It got watered down. We were going to repeal Article, second part, Article 73A which would have taken that, that ability away. Somehow, in committee, it got broken down, and we had to compromise with the Supreme Court justices who do not want that watered down. They want the administrative rules, which belonged to the House. People need to understand that when the House has the control of the administrative rules, that means the people have the, have the, 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 the say. But if the, if the courts have exclusive rulemaking authority, you can't tell a judge, Your Honor, that's a bad idea. Well, you're not going to get a slap in the hand. You could get slapped in jail or a fine or contempt. So uh, it needs to pass. People need to understand that this is your voice. By giving back your voice to the House, it allows you to challenge the rules which are hurting the people. Rule 3, Rule 3.9, Rule 1.2, just to name a couple. Rule 1.2 was a great idea when it came out. It was there to help the people. Geez, you didn't file in time. We waived that rule that you had to file in time so that you could be made whole. That Rule 1.2 of waiver of rules has now changed to we don't have to look at the evidence. Hey, $60,000 you paid in evidence? Jeez, that here, the guardian at litem that said this, which you can't look at, said something totally different, though you have $60,000 worth of evidence. And I use a, a, a dollar figure just to show that 
a lot of work went into it. We're going to waive the rules of evidence and we're going to look at the hearsay because that's more important. And on and on and on. These are issues that are facing New Hampshire. So CACR 26 uh, uh, eliminates the judge's ability to, uh, the Supreme Court's ability to make it, to say that rules are laws. Well, not exactly, and I have to clarify. It was modified. We wanted to eliminate it. It went to the Senate. The Senate compromised with the Supreme Court justices and made it um, and amended it. Now, it is a matter of giving the ability to the House of Representatives to challenge the rules, to fight it. If the, and then, if there is a conflict between the rules and statute or the Constitution, then you can eliminate it. It's a lengthy process. It's not, it's, it's cumbersome and it's fraught with all type of peril because you have to introduce legislation which never looks like the same, it's, it's like making sausage. It really is. We wanted to eliminate it completely. That was the whole idea. We couldn't do it. It took us 20 years, maybe 30 years to get to this point as is, so bird in the hand. Vote for it. Let's, let's fight another day to, to show the, uh, the horrors that are going on. And they are horror stories. When did the redress of grievances committee get put in place? Uh, just this, this uh, 2010. Okay. And that was done by the speaker? Speaker O'Brien. And what happened is people were petitioning the House uh, and there was a type of redress, but it wasn't in a formal committee setting. So uh, there were a number of people that are, are being uh, hurt by the, the New Hampshire family courts. And over and over again, one of the rules was Rule 3, Rule 3 and 3.9. Used to be in New Hampshire, you, you could make an automatic appeal to the Supreme Court. Wow. Geez, there's so many problems and we can't handle all these cases, so we're going to do it at our discretion. So the Supreme Court made a rule. Rule 3 says, no, nah, you know what, we're going to be able to discriminate on this basis, which actually violates our Constitution. However, we're the Supreme Court. Uh, rule 3.9 allows to basically discriminate upon familiar status or at the, at the discretion of the courts. So when there is clear and evident abuse by a judge or a marital master or a guardian at litem, you used to be able to appeal. Since the redress of grievance committee was given subpoena power, the Supreme Court justices ruled that the guardian at litems have quasi-immunity, meaning it, even if they're doing something illegal, even if they're purposely misrepresenting the facts, they obtain immunity. They have more immunity than our police department does. So they can wreck your life, hurt your child by taking that child away from you, listening to hearsay, not listening to statute, totally overlooking the facts, not doing, overbilling their jobs, and you can't come back at them and say, I'm going to sue you. Today, we're introducing within our uh, findings on the Johnson case, on the Dow case, on the other cases, legislation to make them more accountable. This is the Republican Party working for you. It's important to understand that there's more than just ideology, there's more than just friction. There is an intensive hatred for your liberties on the Democratic side. And when you challenge it, they're coming. They're coming just like they came for our founding fathers, and they will not stop. You have to. The people of America fight back and don't take it. There are people that are, are, are scraping by with bread money to serve you. Here in New Hampshire and throughout the country, you can win, you can fight back, and you must. It's your duty. I do have to uh, close unless you have any final questions. Let me just say one thing. We have a uh, set of recommendations that I would like to leave with you. Where is the... Uh, 
we have had um, thousands of people participate in online video conferences uh, to develop Thank you. Uh, proposed legislation for states. And what I'd like to do is give you a copy of this and ask that if you had a chance, no, I'd like to ask that you make a chance uh, to review it. And if, if you could embrace some of these changes uh, and, and uh, propose them in New Hampshire, uh, we would appreciate it. Uh, our first recommendation, I think I may have already told you, is, is have everything recorded. I mean, how can anyone oppose that? In the court of law? Why not? What's wrong with transparency? There could be one exception, and, and it would have to be for consideration, that, that a, a minor child's uh, name be re, you know, blotted out, uh, which can be done. We have technology these days. Uh, or the, you know, if there is a person that is a victim of a violent crime, such as rape or, or incest, that they do not be re-victimized, and that, that, those, that type of information be put out there. In addition to third-party uh, uh, testimony, which uh, you know, at, at some point, but I think for the most part, 90% of that, I think that's a great idea. There's always the exceptions that you have to consider and un unintended consequences, but in the spirit of liberty, and yes, I would absolutely adopt yeah. that idea. And these don't have to be made public. This is just a court record that somebody needs to prove something was said or wasn't said. Correct. It's there. And uh, so everything could be that has to be, uh, you know, confidential. But if you're a party, you ought to have a right to it. And there's. I agree. There are a lot of reasons. I mean, the lawyers and the judges will be more honest if their voices are heard or their facial expressions can be seen. But there's a big problem with falsification of stuff and denial and disappearance of transcripts. And this would clean all of that up. So and whiting out of docket numbers and whiting out oh, jeez, I wonder where that happens. There yes. is so much. I mean, I'm traveling around meeting uh, over a 1,000 people interviewing them and uh, the, the horror stories. So I have never heard of anything like the Redress of Grievance Committee and I absolutely applaud it and uh, uh, the speaker. Uh, what a wonderful thing. One of our recommendations is that special regulatory grand juries be created. It's, it would be doing the same thing that your Redress of Grievances Committee is doing but it would leave you guys free to do other things and would let some uh, 23 citizens deal with it. It would have to be like a grand jury where they're kind of had an extended period of time. I do believe that the the, the re, if if it survives, of this, the Democrats want to get they want to get rid of this committee. If it survives again under the Speaker, it may take it may morph into an oversight committee in New Hampshire, which is a great thing. And if you if I may plug one thing, you bet. Uh, I do have a TV show in Nashua. It's called Speak Up NH. I put it on YouTube, and and it's 99.9% .9 unedited. And it has to do with the people like Ed Burns or, or, uh, or Joe Kennick or Josh Youssef or Dr. Vandenberg, where they can actually tell the public their case and how that they've been mistreated by the New Hampshire Family Courts and on and on and on. So uh, it's, uh, it's out there, and I, I put it out there. It's, it's, it's a service. It's, it Thomas Ball didn't have a chance to go on your show. No. No, and uh, that's, I think... I, I, I think when you're pushed to the edge like that, that's the tip of the iceberg. Why, why more parents aren't breaking down and saying, what the hell are you doing? And why people aren't, aren't you know, revolting because of the injustices. It's happening. It's happening. So. I interviewed a lady yesterday. She's in the United States Army. A judge ruled that that made her unstable, so they gave her children to the paternal grandparents. I interviewed a young lady in Washington, D.C., in Virginia. She stopped her car in a mall driveway, a strip mall, to run her application for a job up to a friend of hers waiting at the entrance to the store. She ran back to her car in more than 30 seconds. A policeman was there, ticketed her for parking in a fire lane. She had an expired driver's license, so she was ticketed for that. Two traffic violations. They sentenced her to three years in maximum security prison. She was seven months pregnant at the time. She gave birth with two arms and, and uh, two legs and one arm strapped to a hospital, prison hospital gurney. They took away her child, she never saw it, and they adopted out her other child. 
She lost her children, has a criminal record, spent the entire three years in prison for parking in a fire lane because her mother and grandmother were whistleblowers trying to expose a corrupt gang task force in this, uh, they're black, in a very white county. Those are just a couple of the stories. It's unbelievable. And it, it, it's intolerable, and we have to. And the only way to fight back is you, you, you have to get involved with your government, and you have to be informed. And God help you if you stay on the Democratic ticket, really, because I, I, I and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm very partisan, and I'm becoming more partisan because I'm seeing people hurt, and I'm seeing the Democrats see that the people are being hurt, and yet. Yeah, they don't want to rock their, their, the boats of, of their friendly people in, in, in the big government. I don't think the Democratic Party is what it used to be. I don't think it's anything close to, to John F. Kennedy times or prior to that. I think there's something that's morphed and the people don't understand, that a radical element uh, has taken over. And, and they're taking your freedoms. They're taking the people's freedoms away. It's, uh, um, it, I have m no words uh, other, other than just, uh, we're, it's breathtaking. Well, very refreshing talking to you. I support you fully. I would nominate you for president of the United States. I take it, uh, we need <laughs> especially some, today. Well, tell you, what we need first is we, we need you in the U.S. House of Representatives. It only takes one representative, as I'm sure you know, to investigate and start impeachment proceedings. I will uh, I'll entertain that my next term. All right. Well, you let me know, and I'll be there. Thank you very much. Thanks.